Okay, welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you all can join us for another discussion on democratizing business capital and the securities legal space. I'm Elizabeth. I'm the managing attorney of the crowdfunding securities law firm, Elizabeth L. Carter, Esquire LLC, which is also the host of this interview series entitled Democratizing Business Capital, hashtag Black Capital Matters, with sponsorship by Law for Economic Democracy. I am also joined by my law clerk, Shanique Ross, who will assist me with the Q&A portion of the interview, which will occur at the end. So why are we doing this interview series? Well, we hope to democratize business capital or help to democratize business capital through an exposition of black capital in all its variety. More specifically, we aim to create an ecosystem of black capital support that better serves both black businesses and investors. This is especially true where black businesses remain systematically under-resourced. For instance, the pandemic forced 41% of black owned businesses to permanently close their doors compared to just 17% of white owned businesses. This is in part due to the insufficient institutional support of Black businesses during this trying time, such as the inequitable distribution of the federal PPP loan program. Thus, it is clear that new systems are needed to counter these stark inequities within the business capital space. For today's interview, I would like to introduce Mariah Lichtenstern. Mariah is the founding director of Diverse City Ventures and managing director of the Founders Institute, Sacramento, California chapter which was recognized by Forbes magazine as the third most gender diverse chapter in the world. She also serves as an advisor to a number of accelerator programs, including Cal C Clean Tech Fund. Lastly, Mariah is a member of UCLA Ventures and is an Aspen Tech Policy Help Fellow, where she advocates for racial equity within venture capital, including her most recent research project entitled Tech Funding Equity. So welcome, Mariah. Are you ready to spill some tea? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so happy to have you here. Like I told you before, uh, you know, this topic, which we entitled in our, um, our, our promo materials, you know, the racist history of the credit investor definition is something that I haven't seen anyone else talk about publicly in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a setting where it's, you know, large. And I know you're doing research and you have published um, different articles and your website has talked a lot about it, about it. I'm really interested in just diving deep into A, just kind of getting to understand where this sort of your interest stem from, but also like who else is talking about it? Is this something that we see as being um, a way towards some real change? Um, so I'm super excited. Like I said, I think as I you know said in the video of the promo, you know we can't really move forward unless we know where we come from. And I think this is right on as we were all you know up to this point and talking and having different interviews of regarding black capital and 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 equity, but really haven't touched on the history part. So I'm super excited. So we can start off with just really just diverse, you know, what is diverse city ventures? Well, first I have to say, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. You are an int intellectual force for one. Um, I am so impressed with the work that you're doing, your motivations and your, your just indefatigability. It's just amazing. And I'm listening, <laughs> I'm listening to uh, Barack Obama's memoir. And so I have like, I'm all up in the space of, you know, just the possibilities of what we, the people can do and uh, forming a, a, a more perfect union together. So I'm hoping to approach this from an optimistic mindset. That's that's what you know. Forever POTUS uh, has you know. That's the frame of mind he has me in this morning. Um, mm. But to your question, um, so diversity ventures, I guess, is is really a culmination of uh, my life's work, starting off, you know from undergrad when I was exposed to the financial industry and. Um, and to entrepreneurship as a means of economic empowerment. I mean, I, I looked around and I know that there's businesses that employ people and, and engage the world, but I just never had examples to see that as a path for you know, myself or to really understand the inner workings. But I had a friend from Ghana who exposed me to the Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cashflow Quadrant, you know, series by uh, Robert Kiyosaki. And by that time, just the work that I had done um, at UC Berkeley, just around social justice, uh, made me realize, wow, this this is a way. But what are the barriers like that? If we can create our own jobs, if we have our own um, economic um foundation within our communities and beyond our communities, um, then, then we can be economically empowered. And that's when I really started delving into the history of how we had been disempowered. There's no lack of entrepreneurship. Anybody from the inner city knows there's some entrepreneurs in the community, right? And so I've had the benefit of being like in growing up in a rural area, living in urban um, areas, um, living in different, different types of communities from affluent to um, really under-resourced. And so 
that was really the beginning. And what I what I found as a main barrier was access to capital, you know, and, and I didn't understand it in the way that I understand it now. But that's really where the journey began. So I knew that I wanted to use what modicum of privilege I I've had in my life um, to open doors and address that lack of access to capital. So I think that was the inception. And with diversity ventures, that really um, manifested around a time when um, the Jobs Act had passed. It was in the Jobs Act, by the way, is a um, it's a um, it's a law <laughs> that um, governs securities, which is you know uh, securities or anything that you raise money for, like any investment opportunities. So that before the Jobs Act, there were a lot of constraints on raising capital. You you could only raise from your own professional network, for example. There were just a lot of things that you know in my graduate school experience when I was studying for motion picture producing, I realized kept people like me who could have worked hard, been educated, um, but, you know, even been adjacent to privilege, you know, I was, I was among some very privileged, um, you know, some very wealthy people, but it didn't necessarily mean that I was a beneficiary of that privilege. And I couldn't just freely raise capital um, from say non-accredited investors, from my community, there was no crowdfunding back then. And so I felt really discouraged and disempowered. But when the Jobs Act came out in 2012, you know, I kind of followed it to see like when it would be implemented and, and how we could seize that opportunity for economic empowerment and access to capital. So around that time, it was uh, 2013, my mother passed, obligations lifted in my life. So 2014, I said, I'm gonna channel my grief into launching this startup that kind of was, um, inspired by the new possibilities of the JOBS Act. And to do so, to incubate and to validate the, the concept, I went into um, Stanford's Tech Entrepreneurship Program online, and that kind of tracked me into Kauffman Fellows. A Fellows Academy is um, an educational component of the Kauffman Society. It's spun out from the Kauffman Foundation, which is a, um, a large organization that supports entrepreneurs. But the Kauffman Society is venture capitalists. So they were putting on these courses, mostly led by like Brad Fell, Jason Mendelson, and um, a handful of others. And through that, I met a sponsor. Um, Rusty Dornan, who was a former CNN correspondent, and she kind of just saw me, you know, navigating the forum and trying to add value and being outspoken. And um, she encouraged me to keep on with the with the program track. And at the end of it, you know, I I thanked her for for pushing me to continue to be involved and expressed to her my interest in venture capital at large. And she encouraged me to join uh, or to apply to the Kaufman Fellows Society, which I did. And um, it was like a graduate school application process. But essentially, when I applied, I applied with the startup that I was working on at the time. And also, I had this vision of diversity ventures that was informed by the work that I'd done in the Kaufman Fellows Academy. And again, culmination of all of that history of wanting to provide access to capital. And uh, um, that really was my, my toe in the door of venture capital. Um, I was accepted as a finalist. And so it was on me to find like a role within an existing venture capital firm that would um, sponsor my fellowship. So as I did that, I got to know some of the existing fellows, interviewing them, getting to meet them, uh, you know, hustling, you know, going from Sacramento to Silicon Valley, driving like two to three hours, you know, setting up, stacking my days with meetings. And, um, you know, that really like was the again the toe in the door in, in in building relationships but at the time what i what i didn't know was that the the ecosystem was still toxic and hadn't done a lot of work on diversity and inclusion i mean i thought in the, all of the years i i mean i was an undergrad in the early 2000s during the dot-com boom and jesse jackson was trying to bridge the digital divide and here we are 2014 he's asking tech companies to release their diversity numbers and there was a lot of hostility and angst around diversity and what that meant um and so you know when i was out there you know speaking to it um it wasn't really necessarily appreciated. It was looked at as a, like a distraction that wasn't related to the meritocracy, um, as they called it, of um, the, the startup ecosystem. So ultimately, I, I felt like if I'm going to make it in this industry, I'm going to have to develop my own track record. I'm going to have to go against the grain. And so um, when Catherine Finney came out with um, Project Diane in 2016, which was the first study to really identify and expose like the statistics around Black women in tech um, between that and Richard Kirby's um, report that came out, who was a VC, I said, okay, I, I'm thinking I need to go and do this startup and, and, and like, you know, show myself as an operator and, you know, or spin out of a firm to, to go into venture capital. But, you know, again, if no one's going to invite me to the table, I've got to build my own table. And so that's when I decided to prioritize diversity ventures.
There we are. Okay. <laughs> so, no, I, I love the story in the background because it, it just speaks to your tenacity and your willpower in terms of you wanted to see your passion for increasing that diversity within the cap or business capital space, see it being done. And you did it at, you know, by any means necessary. So as a black woman in venture capital still, uh, with all its sort of toxicities, what are, and, and, and I'm imagining you have difficulties in raising capital for your own firm. Is that true? And what are some of those challenges? Yeah, I really first saw, and this kind of will speak to what we're, we're getting into today. Um, I really first saw the challenges in raising capital you know, just being on the on the founder side. Uh, and it wasn't just me, like I have my anecdotal experiences, of, you know, everything from the me too experience of like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to meet with this angel investor who's in my domain can be a mentor, maybe an advisor, and they're hitting on me <laughs> to uh, I'm like, I got some great hair. So I'm tempted to be flattered, you know what I mean? But at the same time, you know, as I, as I said to one in particular, look, I need mentors, not fanboys, right? Um, so it's everything from that to just not being taken seriously or, you know, just people just not being interested because they just don't have to care. I don't pattern match. You know, I just saw these things personally, but then I'm seeing like these badass women, like um, I think of Joelle Burke Solomon, who's at Google um, for startups now. And, you know, at this time I'm watching her at TechCrunch. She's winning pitch competitions. I'm like in tears feeling like I'm at the Super Bowl when, you know, like seeing her win right. um, and she's checking all the boxes. I'm seeing Stephanie Lampkin. I'm seeing, you know, I could go, you know, just name a, you know, a ton of people that I'm seeing. And, and Stephanie, she's like out of um, MIT. She's a computer scientist. She has a, a degree in um, from Stanford in, in business, in, you know, tech management, I think business management. Um, and she's having these same experiences. I mean, they're going years right. trying to raise right. funds, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so part of the problem is that to even be VC backable, you have to have a certain level of traction and product development that necessitates, you know, a whole lot of work um, that's either going to be, you know, your own equity, having someone who, you know, your technologist being able to invest the time into building the product, then, you know, like, usually you're going to be bootstrapping, you're going to be pouring your own money in, right, which I certainly did. I poured like, everything, you know, and I'm like, I'm gonna take my, I'm gonna shoot my shot. Um, but then there's a lack of access to friends and family, right, that that can, you know, get right. you to that point where you're venture, venture backable, backable, because, you know, oftentimes we're first generation, right, like, we've been held back so long, like, and, and then not only that, we're, you know, trying to support the rest of our family oftentimes, right, and it's right. almost like we feel guilty for even investing in ourselves or, you know, so there's all these different dynamics at, at play. So I saw it there on the founder side where even people like, you know, I talked to Joel Burke's first um, institutional investor who was um, Will Crowder at that time um, had been working at Comcast Ventures, which is like the diversity arm. And he said, you know, we, we tracked her for three years and they're institutional, right? So they're typically not the first money in. And ultimately they were like, well, you know, We've got to get in, you know, like, but why three years, three years, right. you know, she's obviously right. amazing. And now she's, you know, sold her company part pick to Amazon. But that's just one example that I always give because it's like shining beacon of hello here. Right. Um, and so that's really where I first saw the problem. But I recognize, you know, um, if I'm going to work this hard to raise VC, I might as well work this hard to go and get LP money, right, to invest in a venture firm because I'm going to be able to invest in other um, founders, right, and and I'll have more, I'll be able to have more impact for the level of work that I'm having to put in that's taking away from me, you know, like running my business, right? Um, so with that said, like, yeah, there's a ton of emerging managers, or uh, not really a ton, but there's hundreds of emerging managers that are, you know, starting new firms, and some of them are spinning out, some of them have had exits, you know, there's different, different um, cases, but the challenges are that, you know, when you're starting a fund, you can't really go to institutional um, because they're looking for a track record. They're looking for certain things. They have policies and practices that are informed by a number of different things. So, you know, one of the big challenges, especially as a black woman, um, is you, you're still facing the same, you know, network issues, right? So you have to build a network of high net worth individuals, of family offices. You have to show a track record. You have to show deal flow. Like, you, it's like chicken and egg, cart horse. You know, like, you have to navigate all of these things. Um, and then there's all the regulatory aspect of it. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of challenges that any emerging manager will face, but they're you know, 10x at least for people who are underrepresented, and especially you know when you're and, and let me say this, people who are um, under resourced and, and overlooked, you know, just to change the action of the term, um, as my as my colleague at um, 
uh, Berkeley Sky Deck, uh, Lucia Hicks puts it. Um, so that, yeah, those there's a lot of barriers that mirror what happens in the founder space. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something that we have to navigate. And you mentioned, you know, these other emerging firms, in other words, these other black, uh, well, I say black, but other probably per persons of color, venture capital firms that are coming up and managed by people of color like yourself. Do you find it to be, you know, I mean, and, and especially because this is capitalism, do you find it to be competitive and that is there's too many of you out there instead of you coming together and maybe creating a larger firm or merge? What are your thoughts on that and why, and why maybe it is important to have diversity in, I guess, the, the number of firms? That, you know, you bring up a great point that, you know, I wanted to talk about in terms of like VC economics, right? So um, I'll just jump into that first, because you mentioned like a lot of us coming together, right? Well, if everyone's coming out to come together on fund one, here's the, here's one of the challenges. Uh, okay. A fund one is not going to come out and raise $100 million typically, unless, you know, there's amazing track record already, right? Um, okay. Spinning out of different firms. Okay. And there's very, there's not a whole lot of us in existing firms because of all these historic and network reasons. Um, and so like, even if we were to come together, I mean, if you're raising a small fund, the, this is how this is how VC economics work. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna share the tea here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. And, what, and what's a the, small firm in terms of numbers and compared to a big firm? Kind anything of really under, I, I'll frame it like this and you'll appreciate mm -hmm. this from a regulatory point of view as a, as a lawyer, which I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, so like a fund under 25 million is, it, it's it's under uh, state jurisdiction, right? So that's okay. that's one thing, right? You know, so, <laughs> but uh, so we'll, we'll just use under 25 as small, right? Mm -hmm. and, and typically what you've seen because you have to operate within the constraints of um, the regulations around what's a, you know accredited investors, um, you know qualified purchasers, um, you know all of these things mm -hmm. dictate kind of how much you can raise, and there's a, a there's right. limits on how many investors you can have in a fund, right? right. And so those things first fund be five, ten, twenty, you know, um, and so like. The, the way that that works is, a, is the way that we are compensated is on it with two and 20. That's standard 2% management fee. So you get 2% of funds under management annually, which a lot of us want to recycle back into the fund. And that's another story kind of a little going a little deeper, but essentially 2% management fee, which covers your firm overhead as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you get 20% of carry on, which is basically uh, the back end, right? Like, you know, what it, once you've returned the fund, anything over that, you participate in 20%. And there's some a few different iterations of how that works, but that's carry, it's back end. And the management fee is front end. And so if you have a small $5 million fund, for example, that's $100,000 a year, plus you're paying like 20 grand plus, you know, oh, actually way more than that, like 30 grand just for fund administration, right? Like you've got all of these, all of these costs, you've got to travel, you've got to do all these things. So you can't afford to pay you know, a whole bunch of people, right? So in terms of us coming together in a fund, you know, that's hard. And then, you know, people have their own investment thesis. They have their own, you know, culture and yeah. their own, you know what I mean? And and yeah, is there a scarcity mindset? Probably. Um, I know personally, when I came out as a Kauffman Fellows finalist, like I'm meeting with the who's who's, you know, I reflect on this sometimes, some of the experiences I had, because I still know these people. I'm like, I'm still here, you guys. I still remember, <laughs> you know, like there's definitely people that I have to, you know, credit, like people like Marlon Nichols, who's over at um, Cross Culture uh, or Mac Ventures now um, with Charles King, uh, who like really opened up doors for me. He's one of the Kauffman Fellows. Um, but, you know, like, there's these people who who check the boxes, who who did what what is expected of them, and I'm coming here like I, I don't pattern match, right? And so I don't feel like they were really like, oh, I'm going to be the one to take the risk on this person who doesn't pattern match and like kind of go against the grain when they're trying to raise their fund. They're trying to like fit the mold, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so like yeah, there's that part, and then there's like you know, there's there's a lot of different dynamics, and so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these things are kind of coming out now, uh, like Tyson uh, Clark, who's at Google Ventures, he he really struck a, a chord for me when he was quoting, and I think it was in Forbes or Fortune magazine with some other um, black venture capitalists that are in existing uh, venture capital firms, like very, not their own firms, but known firms. And um, he was saying, you know, I kind of didn't want to rock the boat. I'm paraphrasing. He's like, I kind of didn't want to rock the boat. You know, I probably could have advocated more. But, you know, there's this angst when you're like the first in the room. He's, you know, the second black v 
partner at Google Ventures, uh, Low Tony was the first who came, you know, he came from Andreessen Horowitz and, and wasn't an investor. Google Ventures brings him on an investment role. So, you know, he's not trying to rock the boat too much, right? But then he says in this article, he said, if 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 I, in this position of power, right can't do something, then who can? Who has more power as a black person in BC than me? So there's kind of like this reckoning and almost like this guilt, right? Um, but you have to empathize with that. Like, of course you understand where he's coming from and where a lot of um, black BCs within um, the, the current system are coming from. You know, they've spent years of their lives you know, going through what's expected of them to get into those rooms. Right. And maybe it's just only now that they're in a place where they can um, really be heard and seen. So, you know, again, there's so many dynamics, but at the end of the day, we all have to appreciate our respective roles and try to support and lift each other up in, in advancing the ultimate cause. Yeah, and it's, so it's interesting that you say that in terms of just rocking the boat or being the first and, and having and be, and the mere presence of having a black person in, uh, industry like venture capital? Because the next question I was going to ask is how important is it that you are a Black woman? Because I have seen it in other spaces, even as I'm being intentional about, you know, Black capital matters. And because of the reason why, you know, if we're not intentional, the neglect that sort of kind of comes around it. And then also the responsibility, I feel that being the first or being in these positions um, that we have to really sort of target and look out. But, but as you mentioned, not everyone feels comfortable doing that or not everyone feels comfortable in their position or even probably recognize their power. So the real question is, you know, you being a black woman and you specifically, but just in general, how important is it to have black faces or black presence? Um, does it make a difference in venture capital? Does it? Okay. Absolutely. I think it makes a difference not only in venture capital, but in the whole startup ecosystem and therefore the whole economy. Right. And, and I'll try to, you know, give some examples here. So, um, for one, representation matters, right? Like uh, one of the things that's come up, you know, there's a study from um, that came out from uh, Rate My Investor, and it basically shows that investors invest in people that are like them. They go to the same schools. You have a, they have some affinity, right? It's all a function of network, who you're introduced to, and who makes it to the top of your inbox. I mean, we're human beings, right? At the end of the day, we're human, and not everything is automated, right? So a lot of this is just function of network. So you know, me being able to go and see a Monique Woodard, a, a Sarah Kunst, a, you know, like a I, I guess I could go on, you know, now in, 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 in Arlen Hamilton, you know, um, and Sydney, you know, Sydney Sykes or, you know, just seeing those people in the ecosystem is important to know, hey, maybe I can go and tap into them and they can hit me to the game. Let me know who's safe and not safe. Or, you know, there's that part, right? Like I can see myself in that role and have hope um, where some people just won't even, you know, I, I cite this one example um, when, you um, uh, what it? What was the name? You remember that 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 TV show back in the day with the college, black college students? Help me out here. Um, a different world. Different world. Different world. Okay. But they actually did some uh -huh. studies and they found that um, that when a different world was out, it actually increased enrollment into HBCUs. That's how re much representation matters. And this is not right. new. Like I, I, I come from a, a motion picture background, uh, motion picture producing, but I study, you know, rhetoric and of narrative in the image and film as propaganda, right? Like we know that what we see, the images we see, the media we hear is soft power, right? And and whether that media is who's in a, in a Forbes article, who's, you know, on TV, who's on CNN, these things matter. So representation there. And then like, you know, bringing people in, you know, the businesses that we're investing in, the businesses we have access to because founders feel like they're safer with us or we're going to understand where they're coming from and the culture, et cetera. I mean, how many times have we heard, you know, women going into pitch VCs and I'm saying, well, I need to ask my wife or I don't get it, you know, and they just don't have to invest because they're going to make money anyway, whether they invest you know, beyond their network or not, or right. beyond their understanding, they're going to make money. It's the same in the motion picture industry. You know, you see R-rated films and family films, for example, family films make more money than R-rated films. Mm -hmm. They just do, right? Like, that's the fact. The data has been out there in the Motion Picture Association for ages, but the films that get made the most are R-rated films. Why? Because the people who are making the decisions on what to make want to make those films, and they're going to make money anyway. That's, mm -hmm. that's just what it is. So having representation is also influencing who gets to shoot their shot, right? Um, and, and then there's just the fact that when I'm in rooms, two, two things. One, the self-awareness of people changes, right? Like, so mm -hmm. I, I sit on some boards 
And, you know, I, we, I just had this like retreat, this virtual retreat, and we're debating these issues, you know, like what to prioritize, right? And so we look at two issues and we're, we pick which one are we going to prioritize and why? And some people have, you know, views on like, okay, I want this. And I say, well, well, what about this? And I hear people say, wow, I never even thought about that. That's not even in my lived experience to even think that way. And it's not that they were uh, being malicious and not thinking of that. They just never had exposure to the perspective to consider it. So that's mm -hmm. part of what matters in representation. And then there's also the fact that, you know, if you've got, you know, a table of all white guys talking about stuff, there's going to be a different dynamic than with you put a couple women in the room. It's going to be a little bit, bit different accountability. You might not hear the same kind of locker room talk. I've never, you, you know, you know, you know, I, I had a, a stint in the, in the finance industry and you would hear things in that culture like, you know, balls to the wall. Guys are not going to be talking like that when there's a, a critical mass of women in the room. Like, what? You know, so those things matter. People are more conscious of how they conduct themselves. And, you know, you know, men are gentlemen. They're very polite when there's, a, a, you know, enough women in the room. Right. And then you get them in a different context in the locker room. It's, it could be a different thing. Right. Uh, it's just like how we code switch. You know, when you're amongst all black people, you might throw in a little more dynamic that's for the culture. Right. And so those things matter in terms of representation as well. Um, so I think there's a multitude of reasons, you know, economically, you know, point of view um, that are, are, are reasons why it's critical to have black women. And, and I'll say this, too. Uh, because typically when we talk about diversity, especially in Silicon Valley, what we've seen in the past five, five years is people act like you can't walk and chew gum. When you say diversity, the priority has been on women. And that tends to be white women and Asian women. Mm -hmm. And when you, mm -hmm. when you talk about um, people of color, it tends to be men, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm just going to say for the record that, uh, you know, mantles and stuff like that, you know, they are not specific to white men. You know what I mean? Because you see a similar dynamic. You know, I, I try not to to be a hater or throw shade. I know that, you know, black men need their safe space. Latino men need their safe space. Right. But I see these all male, you know, um, chat rooms, all male panels. And I'm like, what are you doing for the sisters? I mean, right, right. The intersectionality of being black and female, of being Latina and female it shows in the statistics. We are not being yes. brought on as equals. We're not being represented. We're not being uh, put on in the same way because pros. And so, yeah, it matters in that regard too. You know, we have work to do in the gender dynamics. And, you know, even going back to my undergrad days when I was studying, um, you know, representations of people of color in the media, you know, like I was in, I was looking at music. What's the role of music? And and you know, banning the African drum and you know all that. And I saw like just coming of age through the eighties and nineties, going from you know Queen Latifah and MC Light and and Public Enemy to gangster rap and you know the misogyny that and how that impacted the culture, right? And so black women need to be represented and voiced and heard, and not in in a way that we are forced to conform to you know, male dominant, and I'm not trying to say like um, that the culture that we see when I say male dominant is reflective of all men, but there's mm -hmm. a, you know, what you do see and, and there's been movies that have come out about this, that toxic masculinity is bad mm -hmm. for everybody. It's bad for men, it's bad for women. And if we're not coming in representing, you know, then mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's just, you know, the, you get stuff like the queen bee syndrome, you get conformity where, you know, we're just mm -hmm. trying to, again, not shake the boat, right? Cause I, I've right. got my shot and I don't want to mess it up. Um, so yeah, I think it's very important that there's a critical mass of us mm -hmm. for all of those reasons. Yeah, and, it, and I'm so happy that you, you stated both of those. So representation, but also being comfortable with with rocking the boat, right? As this person of color, as this woman, or as this, um, you know, um, black man or black, because it, yeah, you're there, but are you, for instance, changing the metrics so that more of you can come through the, the gate? Or are you just sort of just like, I'm happy to be here? And I think that's what it's about, a difference between being Black, and in this case, Black, uh, because we, like you said, the numbers, I think sometimes people, you know, look at that and say, well, you're being ostracizing. Or you say Black women, what about Black men? But when, like, you made it very, you eloquently stated that if you don't state Black women, this, the word woman will go towards white women, the word people of color go towards men. And, all, and so the black woman just gets forgotten. And so to be intentional, it, it matters so much. So um, in your presence, but also you, you know, explicitly stating that because it, it is a reason why you're saying black women or Latino women, right? It's, it, otherwise, you know, we all, it'd be more representation in these spaces. So 
So I'm glad you just stated that though, because I think people have a misunderstanding of why specific target initiatives matter in that case. And like this, these interview series, like why black capital matters, because if we don't state it specifically, we will get uh, ignored. And, and so going back to, you know, just you being, you know, in that space and being comfortable with shaking the boat, how have your metrics changed in terms of your own particular firm when you're thinking about, because you are automatically, you already have this uh, mandate to be, you know, for diverse founders. Does that mean that you had to shake up or to change some of the sort of mentioned pattern, you know, being able to fit in? Like, what is it that you change in your own firm that would help increase the numbers a lot more than just your presence alone? Well, a couple of things there, and I just want to rewind for a second um, because I, I just thought of another thing that um, there's this there's movement by um, black venture capitalists that are already in existing firms. Right. And I think I mentioned it earlier, the Black VC. And they did this interview with Tyson Clark, who I also um, mentioned earlier. And towards the end, you know, there was this kind of like this sentiment, like, you know, if you're already in your cushy job as a VC, you know what I mean? Like, you, you don't, you're not gonna go and get to the root of issues, right? Because you don't have time to do that. You're, you're here, right? And so I kind of have a privilege coming from the outside and that like, if you're not gonna let me in, I have nothing to lose. Right, so right, I'm right. just to rock this boat. <laughs> mm -hmm. And part of it is just my ethics, just from my background and my, my reason why, like, yes. you know, I want, and then also my investment thesis, I want to capitalize on diverse perspectives. And if I see there's a systemic issue that's preventing me from being able to optimize returns to my limited partners, because, you know, there's a, 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 a bottleneck in, you know, underrepresented folks or overlooked folks even getting to the table, then if I'm addressing that, I'm setting myself up for success, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I have the, the privilege and the risk capacity to be able to address those issues. And I've, and I've just had opportunities like becoming an Aspen Tech Policy Hub Fellow um, that afforded me with, you know, a greater skill set to actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, work towards that change, right? And to, and to build a coalition uh, around it, whereas we might not be able to like take all of our time to do it, but collectively we can all contribute yes. a little bit of time. Now, in terms of diversity ventures in our, you know, we don't have a mandate around like women or under, there's no mandate. And to be honest, like in the roles that I play, whether it's like, you know, I'm an advisor for Berkeley Sky Deck, you mentioned um, CalSeed, which, you know, maybe you have a chance to give an example of um, CalSeed is a clean tech fund here in California. Um, you know, village capital, like a lot point being like a lot of the the founders that I see are not black. I mean, I get I probably get more submissions from black and female and and uh, indigenous and other um, founders than like, you know, Sand Hill Road. And I probably take more. Right. Like, I, I mean, I'll take, you know, cold. Uh, you know, I, I, they, they don't necessarily always make it to the top of my inbox or, or, or highest priority, but like I take more cold intros than I take referrals. The referrals, mm -hmm. I just have probably a higher, you know, get back to you ratio. It's almost like 100 because I recognize mm -hmm. who it's coming from. There's some validation and there's just too much of the other stuff for me to even make it through as a human being with 24 hours in the day. But most mm -hmm. of what I see is still, you know, mostly white male, um, Asian male, like, you know, that's just what it is. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's there's really two parts to that. If we're going to capitalize on diversity, there's two things we can do. Yes, number one, when I see that black founder, I'm not going to underestimate them in the way that someone else might, right? Because I've done the work and I've done the research, so I can understand. And I've been, and I've seen enough um, as a personal operator and working with other companies that I can often add incredible value to them to accelerate them forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm I'm always open to like doing the work if I see an opportunity to like move those founders forward and try to get them on a more level playing field. But even within mm -hmm. firms that are not founded by like black, female, whatever, it's like, okay, you have two founders right now. You have a small team. You have this advisory board or no advisory board. You have an opportunity here because studies show that once you get to 15 people on your founding team, your culture has kind of been set and it's hard to shift it there. So what I've been able to do um, both, you know, personally in my involvement with companies and advising companies directly and even just, you know, having like short term exposure to companies by virtue of like with the CalSeed example, um, I'm able to to help support founders that might not be from underrepresented underrepresented backgrounds to bring on a founding team, an advisory board that will help them to capitalize on diverse perspectives. Because look, if we don't have equitable risk tolerance to, to go out and start our own companies, not to say that we're not doing it because we're doing it in record numbers, right? Like there's no lack of entrepreneurship. There's no lack of pipeline. There's people out there. But if we don't have equitable risk capacity or equitable ability to even move it forward, then 
you know, in parallel, we should also be looking at the C-suite that's out there or the people that can rise to C-suite or just have different operational capacity and can come into these um, these existing companies that, that are going to get in the room to, to pitch VCs and are going to raise friends and family funding because they have that network, right? Now you're on a cap table because you're you're part of the founding team. Now you're building wealth in, in that way. I mean, look at all of the, the people of color that have um, built wealth through the Slack IPO, right? Um, because, you know, that company has been intentional about DEI. And so there's so much opportunity when we're just being inclusive um, across the board, whether the founders are of color or overlooked or underrepresented or not, right? So so that's more of how I look at diversity. I don't look at diversity as meaning women or underrepresented people of color. I see diversity as meaning, um, you know, really harnessing a diversity of thought across gender, ethnicity, geography, life experience, nationality. Like there's no limit. We know that diversity incre increases uh, performance. It, it improves outcomes. There's studies that show that. So I, I look at it in both ways. Um, and the example I was just going to give about, you know, Kelsey, they, they're very intentional about impact and, and uh, you know, how these uh, clean tech, tech um, technologies impact uh, communities that are, you know, disadvantaged by pollution, disproportionately affected by pollution and, and things like that. And, and just, you know, access to adoption of like solar panels and things like that. But this, um, this year, I had the opportunity to you know, like submit questions to all of these founders that are presenting their business plans and and pitching. Um, and, and so after we read their first round, we were able to ask them questions that could influence the second round. So I already know that in your business plan and in your pitch, you're not addressing these issues. And I'm asking these issues like, how are you going to capitalize on diverse perspectives? You know, um, how are you how are you going to you know, incorporate this data that shows that this is that that it can have this impact on your bottom line and just being really intentional about that it was incredible in the next round to see people incorporate that into their pitch now mm -hmm. they're thinking consciously about it because the question has been asked and it's it's set out there as an expectation and you see that reflected um strategically in things like nasdaq came out last week with a proposal to the sec around um requiring uh, companies that are listed to to have um, diverse representation on their board, LGBTQ, female, underrepresented people of color. Um, so, you know, that kind of accountability is another opportunity, you know, in terms of um, getting a, a critical mass of representation and inclusion. Right. And so, again, you just you're a good uh, example of why representation matters, why black uh, capital matters, but also you're rooted. So you're not just a, a black person, a person whose skin color or whose culture is black. You're actually thinking about this from an equitable standpoint that can ask those influence the, those founders' boards. And I, I just, I'm just so grateful that, to have you in the ecosystem because I, a, you're not afraid to do that, and b, you're really setting a trend so that others are like following behind you. It's like this is not so radical. This is just should be like you said. It makes sense. The numbers doesn't lie, and it makes sense to have diverse perspectives. So tell me more about the, your research project with the Aspen Tech Fellow, the Tech Funding Equity, and 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 how did that sort of begin, and where does it kind of fit in with your current work? Yeah, so you know, just mention like the background and like, man. I, when I mentioned being discouraged, you know, when I was in, in grad school and I started studying for my FINRA licenses and reading the actual, like, the, the, the 1933 Securities Act and Securities and Exchange Act of 1934 or whatever the formal uh, title is, you know, I was just like, man, this is not for me. I mean, and what I mean, this is not for me. I mean, this is excluding me from the opportunity. Like, it's excluding people like me. Uh, I was discouraged. Like, yeah, you are studying, this, right. <laughs> you know, it's because here's here's yeah. why we're and, and this is part of this is part of the problem why we need to do things like the tech funding equity project. This is why it matters, because I was sold a bill of goods around investing in myself, taking out student loans because I didn't have mm -hmm. mom, you know, taking out equity in the house. My mom was dis a disabled former registered nurse. I come from very humble beginnings. I emancipated from foster care when I was 17 years old. But I felt like if I work hard, if I make these sacrifices and I don't party and, you know, not that I didn't party, but but like if I, you know, put, you know, really work hard, then the world is mine. That's the American dream. Right. Like I can do whatever I want to do, which is why I, I did something like going to grad school for motion picture producing straight out of, you know, undergrad. Um, 
you know, and, and then just to get into the system, get into it, have invested in myself to only see, oh, there are some systemic barriers. I'm like, dang, I need to go and like recalibrate here. Like I'm taking a risk, you know, that, that um, isn't as calculated as I thought it was. Right. Um, and so it really, the, the, the inception of this project started back then when I realized that these laws were, you know, prohibitive in a lot of ways, but I didn't understand policy. I didn't have a mindset. Oh, let me go and change the laws or let me go and, yeah. and change the 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 regulations or influence change, right? Like I didn't have this we the people um, example, just like I didn't have examples of entrepreneurship until that person seated me with those books, right? Like, um, so, you know, by the time, you know, I, I, I saw what was going on in terms of like Project Diane and, and who was a VC, um, you know, I knew that there are systemic issues but I didn't know how to address it. And I'm living here in Sacramento, where, which is the, the capital of California, which is the fifth largest economy in the world. And I'm meeting people that are, you know, players in the political system, but I'm not understanding how to navigate or even capitalize on that, right? So I'm kind of putting out into the university, like, I need to get this. I, I'm missing something. I felt like there was something missing that I wasn't getting on how to, to make a change, right? Or to um, be part of a change. So when the opportunity came across my desk to apply to the Aspen Tech Policy Hub, it was a brand new program. It had just had one cohort. I was like, this is the universe answering my man. You know, what I'm putting out there is manifesting. And so uh, when I went in, I knew that at that time, like I'm out here as an emerging manager and I'm seeing these barriers. I'm seeing what's happening with founders. So I, I applied kind of with an idea of what I wanted to do, but being like, you know, ignorance on fire really about like what I could actually do. So what they said with the Aspen Tech Policy Hub um, is that we're going to take you from zero to one and where you go from there is up to you. But they basically gave us four weeks of policy through a fire hose. I mean, nine to five in the room, back to back panels, uh, lectures where you're learning, you know, federal, local, um, state, pr uh, private, uh, private sector policy, uh, global. I mean, they just expose us to so much. And then you kind of, you, you know, during this time, you're, you're thinking about what policy problem do you want to uh, solve? And so the policy problem that I arrived at is how might we close the funding gap for underrepresented founders, right? And that, and I, you know, I really look at that as a socioeconomic thing, right? Because yeah. it's not just women and people of color. It's like this whole swath of economically disadvantaged. But if you're like, say, a white male, you're going to be able to navigate into, you know, that 20, you know, 15% of accredited investors to pitch your project much easier than, say, like a black female, right? Um, just for a, a multitude of reasons, right? But um, for the for the sake of scoping the project, I, I honed in on women and um, underrepresented people of color, because if you're addressing those issues, they're gonna benefit everybody else, right? Yeah. So that was the policy problem. And there was this you know, process that we learned on how to like look at who the stakeholders are, you know, scope it down. And so um, we were able to come up with one or two solutions and <laughs> I really, you know, bit off a lot, but, you know, they're so closely interrelated and I didn't want to be that like, you know, walk or you can't walk and chew gum. Um, you know, I didn't want to have that closed mindset on this. And so, you know, what I found is there's those two things. Number one, um, there is a bottleneck around just getting to fundability. And, and that is at the friends and family round. And in all my interviews with founders, all the opportunities I'm hearing them pitch, you know, like it comes up time and time again there's not equitable funding there at the friends and family round. And so, you know, what I, what I uh, kind of sensed and, and did research around is that like, you know, if you're able to raise money from your community without having to come up with 50 grand and make it through some gatekeepers that have a crowdfunding portal, you know, not to not crowdfunding, but under Reg CF, there's all of these barriers to be able to raise from just like the crowd, like general non-accredited investors. Um, and then there's, you know, it's just, it's, it's, very difficult if you don't have enough high net worth people in your network to do a Reg D 506 B offering, which is um, you know where you can um, raise from non up to 35 non accredited investors, uh, but you can't advertise, right? You can't generally uh, do general solicitation. And then you know if you're doing a Reg D 506 C in which you can advertise, um, you know it can only be accredited investors, so you can't bring in you know your friends and family and help them get a piece of this wealth opportunity. Now you you can do the offerings concurrently, but it's hard and expensive enough 
to do one offering, right? So it's just like, you know, seeing those kind of barriers um, around like the regulations and who can invest and all of that. That's one part of the problem, just navigating that. I've seen it firsthand. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is, of course, that even once you get to VC, there's all this bias there, right? And that's been well documented. A lot of the attention goes there. Um, and so I came up with these two solutions around one, challenging the credit investor definition and democratizing that and proposing ways to do that through self-certification, just like you allow credit investors to say, you know, hey, I'm accredited, right? Um, you know, why do we have autonomy on how we spend our money commercially, but not with how we invest our money? You know, it's not like everybody and their mama has access to startup deals, right? Um, right. But like, you know, if you have access to a CPA, to an attorney, you know, whomever that can help you consider a deal, like, why do you need to have a series seven or 82 or 65? Right. You know, why, right. why, you know what I mean? So um, that's definitely one part of it. And then, you know, the other part is, you know, helping the industry who's coming to this awakening of systemic racism. And, and that was just like a bonus that happened with 20, the zeitgeist of 2020. Uh, that part of the silver lining is that people, you know, because of George Floyd and the, the consistent work of the Black Lives Matter movement and other forces um, came to realize oh, there are systemic issues in our country. And, um, and so people actually have have a desire to make a change and to you know question some of their assumptions and that's really what the opportunity pledge part of the tech funding equity project does and it creates a framework that was modeled after the mekong clubs um uh, pledge to end modern day slavery, um, which was formulated by a psychologist, and it creates um, a method of of um, preventing retrenchment, which is you know in white when you look at like um, uh, when you look at a, a racial equity theory of change, uh, entrenchment is basically when like you've made progress and then like there's like taking back of that progress through some other mechanisms. And so if you look at the civil rights movement, an example of entrenchment could be like COINTELPRO and uh, the war on drugs, right? So we've made all these gains, but now we've been taken back. Or you look at the, the um, you know, the way that, that redlining, which was a process of discrimination and, and blocking um, people of color from home ownership and, and the wealth creation there, that which fundamentally created the current wealth gap as we know it, uh, when, when the, Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, you, you look at in 1982, there's a change to the credit investor definition. So even if you've built wealth through real estate in those, you know, less than 15 years, you, you can't take your personal residence and now go and start investing in startups as an accredited investor, right? Like, so things like that are examples of retrenchment. So this framework really anticipates uh, retrenchment and incorporates um, very proactive entrenchment into the framework and, and operationalizes that. So those that's essentially the the, the work that I've been doing as an Aspen Tech Policy Hub Fellow. Wow, you said a, a whole mouthful. So I, I, we only have about 10 minutes, but I really want to kind of get a little more deeper into your work in this space of, of the credit investor definition. So one, you mentioned one solution is to self-certify. Um, can you speak a little bit more about what your proposal is in terms of that, that area and how does that look like in the actual investment space? And then you also mentioned uh, some historical context around the Fair Housing Act. Um, there has been a recent change in the definition um, by the SEC just this past uh, couple months. And what are your thoughts on that? And then also, um, I wasn't there a change in 2008 surrounding the housing crisis and, and sort of talking about what also was going on around there. And the reason why I say that is because I was listening to another interview. He was talking about that it recently changed the credit definition then as well, especially where more, a lot of people getting, you know, homes and everything was like a balloon or uh, this housing part, this bubble. Um, so it seems like, in other words, it was more and more people becoming homeowners, right? Which also means more than could technically become accredited. But it's like, okay, let's make a shift there as well. So it seems like it is natural in, in this SEC space or the credit investment space to make it very exclusionary, uh, very, very exclusionary to who actually can be accredited investor. Um, so it's like they change the rules every time you catch yeah. up to it. So as a black, yeah, so as a black person, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, so right, let's speak to that a little bit more, especially when we talk about black capital and, and network and community, community wealth. What are some of your proposals and what do you see the realistic, uh, I guess, realistic opportunity to see those things come forth? Okay, so we're going to deliver on our promise now, and in, in this time that we have, that we got to go back to the to the to to why we say that these things have a racist underpinning, um, right? And so, first of all, when you look at the accredited investor rule, this dates back to 1933, 1934. The SEC was formed 
in 1934. Uh, and it was like the second part of this, um, you know, wave that started with um, the 1933 Act. And the 1933 Act came about after the stock market crash, the public market, 1929, stock market crash, then we have the Great Depression, right? And so we have all of this stuff going on with the Great Depression. And you know the, the 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 Congress basically did an investigation to figure out why did the stock market crash. So they're they're called the Pecora he hearings, and what they basically found was that there was rampant um, bad actors. You know they were making fraudulent claims. There was insider trading. There was all kinds of manipulation going on, and there was no accountability. And so that was the whole purpose of coming up with the 1933 Act, right? Was to put some checks and balances in place to put some accountability over the public market, okay? Uh, and so by 1934, you know, we've had a change in administration. You have FDR come in and he's doing all of this stuff to, uh, to address the Great Depression. When we look at the climate of the country at that time, you've had race riots across the country. You've had, um, you've had Tulsa, you know, the Rosewood where they burnt down Black Wall Street and there's more than Black Wall Street, one Black Wall Street across the nation. You see this resentment that you have people one, two generations removed from slavery, some of them, you know, former slaves themselves, that despite be having illiteracy, illiteracy imposed upon them, have in these segregated communities established wealth and circulated money within the economy. And so like you have this resentment of white people come in like, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you be wealthy? How dare you be successful? How dare you be proud? I mean, this is pre-Civil Rights Act, right? Where, where this stuff is overt, this stuff is codified, right? And so you have this kind of environment. You also have, you know, uh, I've talked about the motion picture industry a few times in this interview. You, you have um, Birth of a Nation come out and it revitalizes the KKK. So you've got domestic terrorism which we know is like the greatest threat even still today in 2020. Yeah. White supremacist terror, domestic terrorism is the greatest threat to national security in 2020. So back here in the depression era, you've got all of that like a hot simmering mess and it's overt. No one's even trying to hide it. So you've got FDR and he's a Democrat, right? And he's married to Eleanor and she's amazing. And she's all about, you know, women just got the vote not too long ago and she's all about civil rights and women's empowerment. And so, you know, he's, she's vocal, you know, <laughs> you know and, and she's influential. So he's, he's addressing, you know, that side of things, but he's also dealing with his patrons, the people who are paying for his campaigns. And he was, in fact, the, the, um, the longest, uh, he had the longest um, presidency of any, any president. And, and so he's he's pandering to his patrons as well. And these are Southern Democrats. Now, before 1968, before Lyndon Johnson started doing all this civil rights stuff, okay, and he was a, he was a white Southerner, a white racist Southerner. But he actually said, and he's quoted, there's some beautiful articles out there where he speaks to like, I have an opportunity to make up for my past. And he decided to do that. And he said himself, I'm afraid that we have lost the South to the Republicans for the next 20 years. That's what he said, right? So you're back in this time where, you know, the racist core of our country, which just is what it is, is in the fabric of our, of our nation, right? Um, they lived within the Democratic Party at that time. And so while FDR was allowing, was allowing Black people to participate in like depression era relief, superficially this is super this is like you know when you hear people talk about oh the democrats you know they just do all this social you know stuff like you know they 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 just put people on the dole or whatever um there's kind of like that mindset that that's what the democratic party means you know and it's partially because of this era right so you know at the, before this black people were excluded from relief and, and to this day, Black people are less likely to take public relief than their white counterparts. But, you know, at the same time, it's a depression, right? So people are like, thank you. I'm moving from the Republican Party, which fought for Black people to have the vote, to the Democratic Party because FDR is actually helping us through this crisis. But, you know, the, the trade-off there was uh, that he also allowed the systemic you know, um, uh, triggers to be put in place. And that happened partially through the development of the SEC. And the contemporary, during the same year that the SEC was formed, 1934, there was a formation of the Federal um, Housing Authority. There were several different agencies formed. So when you look at like the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was formed at that time, and the Federal Housing Authority, they're the ones that put in, in place the explicit redlining, right? So this explicitly excluded black people and people of color from owning homes, getting loans, moving into white communities. It was a whole set of policies and procedures that did that. Um, and the SEC was more covert, 
right? Because if you can't build wealth in real estate and, and you've got laws over here around accredited investor that exclude all but 3% at the time, at the time it was only 3% of Americans qualified as accredited, mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, yes, this impacts white people, but they can still go and build wealth over here in real estate. Right. And if they're smart, they can make it over here and become accredited investors. Yeah, but right. we're going to make sure the black people don't create wealth over here. And we've made it almost impossible for them to invest in their communities under these regulations. They can still do it under, you know, in the black market. Lord knows they let us do all kinds of stuff in the black market. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then they'll catch us up in the prison industrial complex. Right. right. But it was this, this is this is the economic engineering that basically took place. Um, and so that's what we're really getting at when it comes to like, you know, the work we're doing addressing this because we've lost that cultural memory. And there's people who even think that they really are protecting investors, but they're not. They're just perpetuating this economic inequality. So I'll stop there because I know we're really short on time. Um, no, but I mean, yeah. No, I mean, I love, I mean, first of all, I love that you're so knowledgeable in what you're doing in the space that you're in. So many of us enter the space and like maybe superficially are like, oh, I'm here for this particular reason, but not knowing why you know the system is the way it is and, and maybe you're climbing uphill battle because you're not, if you don't know you don't know how to solve it and the fact that you're able to combine for instance the redlining issues and the ability to create wealth in america through those means and then the sec's definition of what counts as a wealthy person to be able to invest in communities and that black community was systematically excluded from both and that's that's not to mention employment discrimination and all these other so you're really just perpetually on the margin and then here we are 2021 or 2020 with the uprising that's again highlighting these issues of racial inequities it just highlights the importance of your presence in this space of not only you being a black woman but a black woman who understands the systematic issues um and i just have so much faith that with your presence and you training the next generation right that that this, these conversations will happen more often and then also the work being done to counter it and, and so well, i work with people like you only because oh, of people like it's not just me. I can sit up here and pontificate all day, but if someone else isn't like getting it and doing the work, then I'm just right. by myself. Right. I have to give a shout out because I see in the chat Ed Nwakati and African Chief, man, uh, Nigerian African Chief. Let me just shout you out because um, Ed was one of the people that really helped me on my entrepreneurial journey. I tell this story sometimes, but he was one of my first contracts as an entrepreneur when I started Light Star Entertainment. And I used the contract with him to go and buy some of my equipment uh, to launch my first my first company. And so I just want to honor his presence in this um, in this space today and give him a shout out. Hello, I see you and I appreciate Ed. you. All right, Ed, thanks for joining us. No, yeah, and I saw his, his praise for you and I, and I, I think we all can echo that. Um, really, because again, just the work that you do is so necessary. And how can others find the research that you're doing on the credit investigation? And then get yeah, the right issues. Where, where do they locate your work? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put in the chat my website. And I, I do have an ask for folks. I mean, we could wax poetic on this, right? But go to techfundingequity.com. Please sign the petition to democratize the accredited investor definition. There's a link there to a move on petition. I'm working with some uh, women that are emerging managers and other folks in a coalition uh, building attempt to petition the SEC to change the um, the, the the rulings that they came out with that you you asked about the the recent ruling in, in August August 26 it actually just you know basically allowed um, for natural persons to qualify as accredited through um, securities um, right. licensing right and those are those are very expensive time consuming involved often requires they're they're designed for professionals that are advising other people not right. not for making your own personal decisions go and kind of you know, at least sign the petition, get kind of knowledgeable about it, support us as we go, you know, to to the SEC and say, hey, this is why we want to see you change that rule, because you have the right, even once a rule is finalized, you can go and ask them to change any part of it or the whole thing in, in its entirety. And so this is part of my learning um, as an Ask a Tech Policy Fellow and as an American citizen um, mm -hmm. and resident here to, um, to, to exercise my right to petition and to help others recognize that as well. And I thank the Ask a Tech Policy Hub for giving me that exposure and knowledge and expertise that I can now go and share with others. So mm -hmm. please do sign the petition. And then there's other ways that you can get involved. If you're a venture capitalist or a limited partner, um, someone who runs an accelerator, an angel investor, or an angel group, there's ways that you can get involved and taking the opportunity pledge there's resources there for founders so let's get in touch send me ideas i'm you know i'm not i'm not the end all be all you know i'm still learning and receiving so you know 
reach out. I'm a real person. I'm here. Yes, 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 you are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, and you're, like you said, you're accessible. Mariah's on LinkedIn. She's on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Diversity Ventures, um, Light It Star. And I just want to thank you again, Mariah. I mean, I feel like we can go another hour or two just to like really flesh all this out, which we probably, you know, we have others, like you said, even through your initiative, just really working together and really building an ecosystem of support towards uh, equity and, and, and touching the racial context because of the, the negative history and this, this consistent impact that is still causing us that people like to ignore. And that's why I wanted to have this call or this interview specifically on this issue, because oftentimes we talk about, you know, some of the easy stuff. And I think if we point out and say, no SEC, what you did back in 1933, you're still doing. And it's with, now it's time for you to finally see the impact that you're doing and, or at least recognize and do something about it. You know, this is important, right? And like I said, that without you and your presence, you being rooted, I don't think, you know, that will be something that many people will be discussing in terms of the racial inequities that are still causing. So thank you, Mariah. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you. With you offline. Likewise, I've got to get you on my show. Yes, and we've got to get past this Band-Aid appeasement stuff and start healing these wounds of the past. So thank you again. I'm so honored to be here exactly. and appreciate this platform. Exactly. exactly, exactly. And thank you all for joining us, that those who are participating and those who are listening later at the recording of this uh, interview. We will have another interview next week with Kai Norty. Again, moving forward with, you know, the Black hashtag Black Capital Matters interview series to highlight wonderful, wonderful people in this space, whether they're VC, whether they're founders or angel investors or people who are movers and shakers and, and really shaking up a much needed stagnant <laughs> industry when it comes to racial equity. So definitely follow us um, on all you know, social media platforms at ELC, ESQ, LLC. I'm also on LinkedIn, Elizabeth L. Carter, and stay tuned. Thanks again.